All right, today we'll be reading straight through Genesis 32 through 37. We get a meet and greet, a reunion between Jacob and Esau. We get a pretty horrific incident between uh, Dinah and these group of people called uh, the Shechemites. And paging through, you can see in your chapter headings, if you just want to look through in your Bible, you'll see Jacob returns to Beth Al, a place that you might have noted from a few uh, readings ago. And we get a little genealogy of um, Esau's descendants. You want to pay close attention to some infamous names that show up in his family tree. And... Joseph. We get to zoom in on the life of Joseph. All of that and more in today's episode of the Dwelling Richly podcast. Stick around. See you in a bit. Welcome back. I'm Jennifer Richmond, and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, where we love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength. We are women who enthusiastically and intentionally dwell in the Word and let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. You can find Bible studies and video teaching like this on my blog and the Dwelling Richly podcast. Subscribe to this channel, hit that little church bell so you can get notified whenever I drop a new video. Let's get into the Word. All right, let's get into God's Word here together today. I'm really glad you guys are back here with me. If you haven't already, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. And uh, for crying out loud, leave a comment, say hi, ask a question, engage with our community. Glad you guys are with me, with, with me here <laughs> to do just that. <laughs> I can speak, I can talk, words. All right, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at our lesson for today, which is from uh, lesson one, of course, and this is day seven. We'll be reading through, as I said in the intro, uh, from Genesis chapter 26 through, tw nope, Genesis 32 through 37. <laughs> Again, words, I can do this, right? Uh, open up your lesson. Let's take a look at the beginning uh, a reminder for prayer. And let me go ahead and read that to you, and then we'll pray. There's a lot on your plate today. Take a deep breath. <laughs> And instead of just jumping in to today's lesson, pray with your hands open, palms facing up, and ask God to help you with all that is on your heart and mind and write your prayer here. All right, let's go ahead and do that. I know if you're like me, you have a lot on your plate, a lot on your mind, a lot on your heart. And uh, let's release that to the Lord so that we can focus today on our Bible reading. Here we go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do lift up our study to you. And Lord, I especially lift up to everyone listening to my voice right now. There's so much going on in our lives and we release it to you. We have a tendency to take it back and we acknowledge that. So we just lay it before you. We release everything that's going on in our life to you. We ask, Father, you give us wisdom, understanding, and peace as we read your word today. In spite of some of the challenging passages we're going to be digging through, we ask God that you would help us just to trust and to see you through it all. Keep our eyes focused on you. We thank you that your word is mighty and powerful. It's alive and it can teach us. And so we come before you and submit that to you right now in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Um, so in our Memorize and Meditate, as we've been doing throughout this lesson, focusing on Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, we've been practicing that verse for seven days now. How are you doing? Can you write it from memory? Share your progress with a friend. Be an encouragement with someone today. Um, the Dwelling Richly Bible Study is about community. It's not about you just getting Bible study done, but it's about engaging. And if you have gone seven days already and you have yet to reach out to somebody in your grace group or share in our Dwelling Richly Facebook group or even just post a comment here, then you're missing out on a very important aspect of this Bible study. It's not just about you doing a study. It's about you dwelling richly and letting the word of Christ dwell in you. And part of that is engaging in community. So take time to memorize a course and meditate on God's word today from Isaiah 40, 28, and then take time to share that progress and be an encouragement to somebody else in one of your groups today, dwelling richly community group on Facebook, our online community on, over on Instagram. Just use the hashtag dwelling richly when you share right here in the comments section, uh, in our group, um, through our church app. So lots of ways to connect. So please do that. Be a, a truly rich and dwelling richly in this community. All right. Number three, read and engage. Some accounts we, re we relate well to. Um, others are confusing and still others leave us feeling shocked. Ask God for wisdom and understanding as you read today. We're going to need it. And don't let your emotional reaction keep you from learning as you consider these accounts. So I want to go before us today 
and uh, just let you know this is going to be a challenging chunk and uh, we're going to read through it and just um, ask God for the grace to understand that this was written for us but not to us and uh, that we can take this as an ancient historical document that is for our benefit because it's inspired words of God. And as challenging as part of today's lesson will be, we ask that God will give us the wisdom to um, move beyond um, this moment in history to God's um, application for our own heart. Let's go ahead and begin and we'll dive right into Genesis uh, chapter 32. So Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he exclaimed, this is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim. Jacob sent messengers on ahead to his brother Esau in the land of Seir in the region of Edom. He commanded them, this is what you must say to my Lord Esau. This is what your servant Jacob says. I have been staying with Laban until now. I have oxen, donkeys, sheep, male and female servants. I have sent this message to inform my Lord so that I may find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob and said, we went to your brother Esau. He is coming to meet you and has 400 men with him. Oh, gosh, if this was a drama, if this was set to film, man, you'd hear the dum 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 music playing right now. Verse seven, Jacob was very afraid and upset. You remember last time they had this encounter, he cheated him out of his birthright and he cheated him out of a blessing as well. Jacob was very afraid and upset. So he divided the people who were with him into two camps, as well as the flocks, herds, and camels. If Esau attacks one camp, he thought, then the other camp will be able to escape. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, you said to me, return to your land and to your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am not worthy of all the faithful love you have shown to your servant. With only my walking stick, I crossed the Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Rescue me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me as well as the mothers with their children. But you said, I will certainly make you prosper and make your descendants like the sand on the seashore too numerous to count. Jacob stayed there at night. Then he sent as a gift to his brother Esau 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 20 ewes, 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys. He entrusted them to his servants who divided them into herds. He told his servants, pass over before me and give some distance between one herd and the next. He instructed the servant leading the first herd, when my brother Esau meets you and asks, to whom do you belong? Where are you going? Whose herds are you driving? Then you must say, they belong to your servant, Jacob. They have been sent as a gift to my Lord, Esau. In fact, Jacob himself is behind us. He also gave these instructions to the second and third servants, as well as those who were following the herd, saying, You must say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. You must also say, In fact, your servant Jacob is behind us. Jacob thought, I will first appease him by sending a gift ahead of me. After that, I will meet him. Perhaps he will accept me. So the gifts were sent on ahead of him while he spent the night in the camp. During the night, Jacob quickly took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream along with all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. Then a man wrestled with him until, day, j <laughs> until daybreak. When the man saw he could not defeat Jacob, he struck the socket of his hip so the socket of Jacob's hip was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. I will not let you go, Jacob replied, unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? He answered, Jacob. No longer will your name be Jacob, the man told him, but Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, please tell me your name. Why do you ask my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. So Jacob named the place Peniel saying, explaining, certainly I have seen God face to face and have survived. The sun rose over him as he crossed over Penuel, but he was limping because of his hip. That is why to this day the Israelites do not eat the sinew which is attached to the socket of the hip, because he struck the socket of Jacob's hip near the attached sinew. Chapter 33. Jacob looked up and saw that Esau was coming along with 400 men. 
So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the servants and their children behind them and Rachel and Joseph behind them. But Jacob himself went on ahead of them. And he bowed toward the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, hugged his neck and kissed him. Then they both wept. When Esau looked up and saw the women and the children, he asked, who are these people with you? Jacob replied, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. The female servants came forward with their children and bowed down. Then Leah came forward with her children and they bowed down. Finally, Joseph and Rachel came forward and bowed down. Esau then asked, what did you intend by sending all these herds to me? Jacob replied, to find favor in your sight, my lord. But Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Keep what belongs to you. No, please take them, Jacob said. If I have found favor in your sight, accept my gift from my hand. Now that I have seen your face and you have accepted me, it is as if I have seen the face of God. Please take my present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. When Jacob urged him, he took it. Then Esau said, Let's be on our way. I will go in front of you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are young and that I have took I have to look after the sheep and cattle that are nursing their young. If they are driven too hard for even a single day, all the animals will die. Let my Lord go on ahead of his servant. I will travel more slowly at the pace of the herds and the children until I come to my Lord at Seir. So Esau said, let me leave some of my men with you. Why do that? Jacob replied. My Lord has already been kind enough to me. So that same day, Esau made his way back to Seir. But Jacob traveled to Sukkoth, where he built himself a house and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place was called Sukkoth. Now, again, please pause and highlight. I want you to highlight especially this place called, uh, that he called Sukkoth. It's important and it absolutely comes up later. So please make sure you note that and get ready later, later, like always later. But anyway, make a note of it. <laughs> After he left Fadan Aram, Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem in the land of Canaan, and he camped near the city. Then he purchased the portion of the field where he had pitched his tent. He bought it from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of, of money. And then he set up an altar and called it, The God of Israel is God. Chapter 34. Now Dinah, Leah's daughter, whom she bore to Jacob, went to meet the young women of the land. When Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hivite, who ruled the area, saw her, he grabbed her, forced himself on her, and sexually assaulted her. Then he became very attached to Dinah, Jacob's daughter. He fell in love with her, the young woman, and spoke romantically to her. Shechem said to his father, Hamor, acquire this young girl as my wife. When Jacob heard that Shechem had violated his daughter, Dinah, his sons were with the livestock in the field. So Jacob remained silent until they came in. Then Shechem's father, Hamor, went to speak with Jacob about Dinah. Now Jacob's sons had come in from the field when they heard the news. They were offended and very angry because Shechem had disgraced Israel by sexually assaulting Jacob's daughter, a crime that should not be committed. But Hamor made this appeal to them. My son Shechem is in love with your daughter. Please give her to him as his wife. Intermarry with us. Let us marry your daughters and take your daughters as wives for yourselves. You may live among us and the land will be open to you. Live in it, travel freely in it and acquire property in it. Then Shechem said to Dinah's father and brother, let me find favor in your sight and whatever you require of me, I'll give. You can make the bride price and the gift I must bring very expensive and I'll give whatever you ask of me. Just Give me the young woman as my wife. Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully when they spoke because Shechem had violated their sister Dinah. They said to them, We cannot give you our sister to this man who is not circumcised, for it would be a disgrace to us. We will give you with our consent on this one condition. You must become like us by circumcising all your males. Then we will give our daughters to marry and will take your daughters as wives for ourselves and we will live among you and become one people but if you do not agree to our terms by being circumcised then we will take our sister and depart their offer pleased Hamor and his son Shechem the young men did not delay in doing what they asked because they, he wanted Jacob's daughter Dinah badly now he was more important than anyone in his father's household so Hamor and his son Shechem went to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city 
These men are at peace with us, so let them live in the land and travel freely in it, for the land is wide enough for them. We will take their daughters for wives, and we will give them our daughters to marry. Only on this one condition will these men consent to live with us and become one people. They demanded that every male among us be circumcised just as they are circumcised. If we do so, won't their livestock, their property, and all their animals become ours? So let's consent to their demands so they will live among us. All the men who assembled at the city gate agreed with Hamor and his son Shechem. Every male who assembled at the city gate was circumcised. In three days, when they were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and went to the unsuspecting city and slaughtered every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword, took Dinah from Shechem's house and left, Jacob's sons killed them and looted the city because their sister had been violated. They took their flocks, herds, and donkeys, as well as everything in the city and in the surrounding fields. They captured as plunder all their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives, including everything in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought ruin on me by making me a foul odor among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, I am few in number. They will join forces against me and attack me, and both I and my family will be destroyed. But Simeon and Levi replied, Should he treat our sister like a common prostitute? Whew. Tough. Huh. Tough chapter. Tough stuff. All right, here we go. Chapter 35. Then God said to Jacob, Go up at once to Bethel and live there. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Remember Bethel in your previous notes. You should have highlighted that before. Highlight it again now if you haven't already in brown to note that it's a special place. So Jacob told his household and all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have among you. Purify yourselves. Change your clothes. Let us go up at once to Bethel. Then I will make an altar there to God who responded to me in my time of distress and has been with me whenever I went. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods that were in their possession and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob buried them under the oak near Shechem and they started on their journey. The surrounded cities were afraid of God and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Jacob and all those who were with him arrived at Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. He built an altar there and named the place El Bethel because their God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried under the oak below Bethel. Thus it was named Oak of Weeping. God appeared to Jacob again after he returned from Padan Aram and blessed him. God said to him, Your name is Jacob, but your name will no longer be called Jacob. Israel will be your name. So God named him Israel. Then God said to him, I am the sovereign God. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation, even a company of nations, will descend from you. The kings will be among your descendants. The land I give to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you. To your descendants I will also give this land. Then God went up from the place where he spoke with him. So Jacob set up a sacred stone pillar in the place where God spoke with him. He poured out a drink offering and then he poured oil on it. Jacob named the place where God spoke with him Bethel. They traveled on from Bethel, and when uh, Ephrath was still some distance away, Rachel went into labor, and her labor was hard. When her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you are having a son. With her dying breath, she named him Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin instead. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a marker over her grave. It is the marker of Rachel's grave to this day. Then Israel traveled on and pitched his tent. Notice the name change used by the author here. Verse 21. Make a note of it. Israel traveled on and pitched his tent beyond Migdal Eder. While Israel was living in that land, Reuben went to bed with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Jacob had 12 sons. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, as well as Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, were Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Zilpah, Leah's servant, were Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. So Jacob came back to his father Isaac in Mamre, to Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham Isaac had stayed. 
Isaac lived to be 180 years old. Then Isaac breathed his last and joined his ancestors. He died an old man who had lived a full life. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him. What follows, chapter 36, what follows is the account of Esau, also known as Edom. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites, Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, Oholibama, Chapter 36. What follows is the account of Esau, also known as Edom. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites, Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Oholibama, the daughter of Anna, the granddaughter of Zibion, the Hivite, in addition to Besamoth, the daughter of Ishmael, and sister of Nebaioth. Adah bore Eliphaz to Esau, Besamoth bore Reuel, and Oholibama bore Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, all the people in his household, his livestock, his animals, and all his possessions that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. And he went to a land some distance away from Jacob, his brother, because they had too many possessions to be able to stay together. And the land where they settled was not able to support them because of their livestock. So Esau, also known as Edom, lived in the hill country of Seir. This is the account of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Esau's wife, Adah. Reuel, the son of Esau's wife, Besamoth. These are the sons of Eliphaz, Timon, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, Kenaz. Timnah, the concubine of Esau's son, Eliphaz, bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Adah. These are the sons of Reuel, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, Mizah. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Besamoth. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Oholibah. <laughs> These are the sons of Esau's wife, Oholibama. The <laughs> These are the sons of Esau's wife, Oholibama. The daughter of Anna, the granddaughter of Zibion, she bore Jeush, Jalam, and Korah to Esau. These are the chiefs among the descendants of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, Esau's firstborn, Chief Timon, Chief Omar, Chief Zepho, Chief Kenaz. Chief Korah, Chief Gatam, Chief Amalek. These are the chief descendants from Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Adah. These are the sons of Esau's son, Raul, Chief Nahath, Chief Zerah, Chief Shammah, Chief Mizah. These are the chiefs descended from Raul in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Besamoth. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Oholibama, Chief Jeush, Chief Jalam, Chief Korah. These are the dis chief descendant from Esau's wife, Oholibama, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Esau, also known as Edom. These were their chiefs. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, who were living in the land, Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Anna, Dishan, Ezer, Dishan, and These were the sons of Seir, the Horite, who were living in the land, Lotan, Shobal, Zibion, Aha, Anna, Dishan, Ezer, Dishan. These are the chiefs of the Horites, the descendants of Seir in the land of Edom. The sons of Lotan were Hori, Omam. Lotan's sister was Timna. These are the sons of Shobal, Alvan, Manahath, Ebal, Shepho, and Onam. These are the sons of Zibion. Aya and Anna, who discovered the hot springs in the wilderness as he pastured the donkeys of his father Zibion. Make a note of that. <laughs> I mean, whenever a genealogy, a, a descendant line 
uh, pauses to give you a little tidbit about somebody, make a note of it. It's super cool. These were the, <laughs> verse 25, these are the children of Anna, Dishan and Aholibama, the daughter of Anna. These are the sons of Dishan, Hemdan, Eshban, Ithran, Keron. These are the sons of Ezer, Bilhan, Zavan, and Akan. These are the sons of Dishan, Us, and Aran. These are the chiefs of the Horites, Chief Lotan, Chief Shobal, Chief Zibian, Chief Anna, Chief Dishan, Chief Ezer, Chief Dishan. So it's Dishon, I should say, and Dishan. So D-I-S-H-O-N, D-I-S-H-A-N. For those of you who are just listening along, you're, it's hard to see the difference, but I'm not doing a great job of pronunciating, pronounce, pronouncing those. <laughs> chief Dishon and Chief Dishan. These are the chiefs of the Horites according to their chief lists in the land of Seir. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king ruled over the Israelites. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom. The name of his city was Dinhaba. When Bela died, Jobab, the son of Zerah from Bozrah, reigned in his place. When Jobab died, Husham from the land of the Temanites reigned in his place. When Husham died, Hadad, the son of Bedad, who defeated the Midianites in the land of Moab, reigned in his place. The name of his city was Avith. When Hadad died, Shamla from Masara. When Hadad died, Samla from Masraka reigned in his place. When Samla died, Shaul from Rehoboth on the river reigned in his place. When Shaul died, Baal Hanan, the son of Ekbor, reigned in his place. When Baal Hanan, the son of Ekbor, died, Hadad reigned in his place. The name of his city was Pau. His wife's name was Mehetabal, the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Mezahab. These are the names of the chiefs of Esau, according to their families, according to their places, by their names, Chief Timnah, Chief Alva, Chief Jeteth, Chief Chief Oholibama, Chief Ela, Chief Pinon, Chief Kenaz, Chief Teman, Chief Mibsar, Mibsar, Chief Magdale, Chief Aram, these are the chiefs of Edom according to their settlements in the land they possessed. This was Esau, the father of the Edomites. From here we transition and focus and zoom in on one of Israel's sons. Joseph should be familiar to many of you. Chapter 37, here we go. But Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, in the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, his 17-year-old son, was taking care of the flocks with his brothers. Now, he was a youngster working in the with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. Joseph brought back a bad report about them to his father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was a son born to him late in life, and he made a special tunic for him. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated Joseph and were not able to speak to him kindly. Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves of grain in the middle of the field, and suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright, and your sheaves surrounded my sheep and bowed down to it. Then his brothers asked him, do you really think you will rule over us or have dominion over us? They hated him even more because of his dream and because of what he said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars are bowing down to me. When he told his father and his brothers, his father rebuked him, saying, What is this dream that you had? Will I, your mother, and your brothers really come and bow down to you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept in mind what Joseph had said. When his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, Israel said to Joseph, Your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I will send you to them. I'm ready, Joseph replied. So Jacob said to him, Go now and check on the welfare of your brothers on the flocks and bring me word. So Jacob sent him from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph reached Shechem, a man found him wandering in the field. So the man asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm Looking for my brothers. Please tell them, tell me where they are grazing their flocks. The man said, They left this area, for I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Do at Dothan. Now Joseph's brothers saw him from a distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, 
Here comes this master of dreams. Come now, let's kill him. Throw him into one of the cisterns and they, and then say that a wild animal ate him. Then we'll see how his dreams come out. When Reuben heard this, he rescued Joseph from their hands saying, let's not take his life. Reuben continued, don't shed blood. Throw him into the cistern that is here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this so he could rescue Joseph from them and take him back to his father. When Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped him of his tunic, the special tunic he wore. Then they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat their food. They looked up. They saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying spices, balm, and myrrh down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, but let's not lay a hand on him. For after all, he is our brother, our own flesh. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants passed by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern, sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. The Ishmaelites then took Joseph to Egypt. So the Ishmaelite name should be familiar to you from previous lessons. So make sure that's underlined again. And that's coming back into play here as they relocate Joseph down to Egypt. Verse 29. Later, Reuben returned to the cistern to find that Joseph was not in it. He tore his clothes. He returned to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. And where could I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a young goat, dipped it in the tunic, dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they brought the special tunic to their father and said, we found this. Determine now whether this is your son's tunic or not. He recognized it and exclaimed, it's my son's tunic. A wild animal has eaten him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on a sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters stood by him to console him, but he refused to be consoled. No, he said, I will go to the grave mourning my son. So Joseph's father wept for him. Now in Egypt, the Midianites sold Joseph to Potiphar one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. All right. So with that, we conclude today's uh, day in our lesson one, day seven here in lesson one, and uh, move on to into uh, day eight tomorrow. So thank you for being here with me. Leave a comment, say hi, uh, ask your questions, engage in our community. Like I mentioned earlier, we're on Facebook. We're right here in this podcast. And you can always uh, connect with us in our group. If you're part of the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, we have a private group you can connect with there on our church app. All right. Thanks again, guys, for being here with me. I always enjoy our time together. It makes me think. It makes me happy to imagine you thinking through and reading through this with me as well. And know, as always, you are loved and prayed for. And I look forward to being back here again with you real soon. Bye-bye for now.